Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Open Mic VO. My name is Graham Spicer, and so glad that you're here with us tonight. Open Mic VO is this hour that we set aside on Sunday evenings just to get together and yak about a topic of interest to voice actors. Uh, tonight's topic is audiobooks. Anything to do with audiobooks, uh, we're going to be chatting about tonight. Production, performance, how to get audiobook work. We're going to be talking about all of these things tonight. Uh, just a couple of uh, requests before we get started. The first one is, uh, please keep yourself muted at your end if you're not actively participating in the conversation. I really don't want to dissuade anybody from unmuting themselves and speaking, whether it's asking a question or providing us with your thoughts on a specific topic. But please, if you're not actually speaking, keep yourself muted. And then we don't have any issues with dogs barking and uh, echo and feedback, things like that. Uh, the second thing is, is that we're all professionals here. Some of us are uh, longer standing professionals than others, but we're all professionals nonetheless. So let's keep everything on a professional level. Um, so uh, positive, forward looking, um, no, you know, excessively negative uh, comments or you know, name calling, that kind of stuff. And the third thing is remember that we're recording and I'm going to post the recording to YouTube. So uh, certainly want you to fully participate in the conversation, but just keep in mind that if you're going to uh, share any information that might be sensitive or proprietary, that once this gets posted to YouTube, I really can't control where it ends up. It's not as if there's hundreds of people looking at the YouTube videos, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you never know where the info could end up. So just keep that in mind. So with that said, I'm going to start unmuting people. Tonight's topic is audiobooks. Any questions, uh, any comments with regards to audiobooks are welcome. Once again, I'm just starting to unmute people here. This is a little tedious. I have to do it one by one. Sorry about that. So once you see that you are unmuted, if you want to get us started with the first question or the first comment about uh, the audiobook biz, let us, uh, let us know. Ah, Carol, thank you. Good question. Um, I uh, obviously wasn't at uh, APAC last week. APAC, for those of you who might not be aware, is the um, Audio Book Producers Association something. <laughs> what is it, Carol? Audio Publishers Association Conference. Okay, conference. Thank you. Um, so you were there, I assume? I was, yes. For part of the time, actually. I uh, I couldn't stay the whole time, but I did do the diagnostics, the director's diagnostics, and uh, I attended a couple of sessions. And did Johnny Heller's splendiferous uh, event happen the day after, as usual? It happened the day before. I wasn't uh, participating this year, but um, everyone s spoke very highly of it. Fantastic. I'm not surprised. Johnny has done a great job with... Uh, you know, considering he started from nothing, getting that event to be, you know, almost as well known as APAC itself, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody with us tonight that was at uh, APAC at the conference last week, which is all about audiobooks for three days? Rich says that he was there. Rich, do you have any comments on, on, uh, any general feelings about how the conference went? Is there any specific nugget of genius that you took away from it that you want to share with us? Um, I wouldn't say, well, first I'd say, hi, Carol. Um, I wouldn't say there was any one specific nugget, um, but there were a lot of little nuggets that I got from Johnny's workshop and from drinks before APAC and <laughs> from APAC itself. 
and from drinks after APAC, and from uh, the Naughties, which is the party that happens during and after the Audis Award Ceremony on Thursday. So it's, uh, it's definitely a multi-day event, and um, there were a lot of little nuggets along the way. Fantastic. Uh, was this your first APAC this year, or have you been to them in the, in the past? Uh, this was my second. So I was there last year and I also did Johnny's workshop last year and um, and then I did the conference both times. I spent more time at the events that kind of surround APAC that are loosely associated with it uh, instead of being right there just during the day that day, going out with people afterwards and, and just, you know, chatting. So are you suggesting that there was drinking involved? Uh, no comment. <laughs> well, you know, you do have to stay hydrated in this business. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Rich. Your Thank picture you. is very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> That's my little baby. Um, James, you were there. Any uh, specific piece of genius that you walked away from, from APAC this year or from Johnny's event? Uh, yeah, I went to both. I only went to Johnny's event last year. I did. Oh, sorry, we we lost you, James. You're hello. Are you on your mic? Let me check and see. Hold on. James is busy checking his mic. Test one, two, three. While he's doing that, and we look at his dog, um, for the, again, for those of you who may not be aware, um, so the Audiobook Producers Association Conference, and then Johnny Heller, who we're referring to. Johnny Heller is uh, an audiobook a narrator and coach. And I don't know, about five years ago, I think it was, it might even be six years ago now, he decided he was going to run a little workshop, either just before or just after the APAC conference itself, and it's grown into something that's almost as big as APAC is. And uh, so, so that's Johnny Heller. He's a, a coach and a narrator and a, um, and a peer of Carol Mondas. They both coach uh, in audiobooks at Edge Studio and elsewhere. Yes, and in fact, in October, we're going to do, I didn't think I was uh, going to attend this year, but we've done also now three years running uh, a, a really cool relaxathon, he calls yeah, it. in a sweet thing, in, don't you? Yeah, yeah, in Rhode Island in October. Fantastic. So, so tell us a little bit more about that in case someone here was would be interested in attending. Okay, um, so I, I guess... Generally speaking, first of all, I know that it's going to be the 19th of October through the 22nd. So we arrive usually Friday and leave Sunday afternoon. And it's usually about eight or nine coaches. Um, sometimes it will there will be some publishers as well, casting folk. Um, and that will be the case this year. He's still um, firming up some of the attendees for, for the panels, but I know um, Paul Rubin and Paula, his wife, uh, who is a director, an audiobook director, will be there. And um, someone from Penguin Random House will be there. I'm not sure who. Um, so we, we sort of mix it up um, between audiobooks uh, in panels and also in workshops and then a few one-on-ones at least every participant has at least one um private session short private session with at least one coach and uh it's at this beautiful bucolic lovely uh, conference center that's right on the water and there's a big bonfire area it's a it's quite a lovely it really is a relaxing environment and so the sense of performance or pressure or you know networking is much reduced in terms of any stress it's really just a kind of a a love fest everybody can ask any question at any time and so it's uh, it's kind of like camping but in cabins, actual beautiful hotel rooms. 
yeah, when you say it's like camping, it's not like I have to bring my sleeping bag or anything, right? Right. Yeah, I, sh I guess I shouldn't have said it. Camping only in the sense that it's the fall and it's there's water and there's, you know, that nice fireplace inside and out, actually. Um, so it just, it feels cozy, I should say. Fantastic. How many participants are generally, are generally uh, there? I think we had about six. 70 last year and 50 the year before. I think it's capped um, just because of room. Uh, although I, I've, I've heard that there are a couple of hotels nearby that some of the quote unquote spillover uh, guests, you know, uh, stayed in. But I think it's still going to be relatively, you know, kept, kept under a hundred for sure. So, if there's eight or nine coaches, then the ratio of coaches to students is pretty high in this case. Yeah, exactly. And and the neat thing I think about the 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 environment, not only physically, but um, but you know, just in the colleague connective way, is that um, there is this mix of you know, eight people will be on a panel. Um, it'll be Q and A, and then you know there will be breakout sessions of two or three or four coaches with a particular focus in mind. Johnny also started to introduce commercial classes, uh, just me very very peripherally to this. Um, I guess last year, so um, so that's a piece of it as well. Fantastic. Um, how much is it? Do you know, Carol? Um. Let me get back to you. I, I can look it up right now, actually. Okay. Yeah, or I could at oh, least yeah, give I, I'd be interested to know. So, and I assume the yeah. price in, includes the room, does it? it? It not only includes the room, it includes three meals a day, which are really quite, really quite yummy. Um, so you, you are um, really afforded the full, you know, package of all you'd need including towels and beds not you know sleeping bags yeah paula um put into the uh chat box she says hey it sounds like glamping <laughs> that's exactly right just just glamping and and uh you know yakking glamping and yakking fantastic well let us know uh how much it is and once again it's the 19th 20th and 21st i think you said didn't you that's right. I might have said 22nd, but I would have been wrong. So yeah, it's okay. Friday through Sunday. Certainly the 19th is the, is cool. the first day. Um, and there was one other thing, um, yeah. but I'll get back to you about that too. Please let us know once you uh, get that, uh, that info for us. And Jane, uh, I, I see I'm that back. you're back. Um, I'm are back. you on mic now? I don't know what's going on. Your levels are, you're there, but your levels are really low. Okay, I have to figure this out. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> Is there anyone else here that was at uh, the Johnny Heller Splendiferous uh, uh, workshop last week or at APAC or the Audi Awards? Is there anyone here that was nominated for or perhaps won uh, an award last week? Carol, were you nominated this year? No. No. No, I wasn't. No. These people I, have no taste whatsoever. I know. But, you know, it really is just a privilege to be in the business, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to say? Yeah. In the business. And, and as long as you're obviously doing something right, if you keep getting books. That's true. That's true. Hopefully. That's or at least true. fooling people enough of the time. Uh, Paul is asking, uh, where and when can we sign up for this uh, fall event, Carol? Okay, so I know that Stephen J. Cohen is kind of the logistics. He's sort of the stage manager of, of the thing. Um, so you might want to find not. Correct. What? Good to hear that Johnny's not stage managing it or responsible for yeah. the organization of it. That's that's right. He has he has the vision, um, and he even will design certain uh, you know aspects of the the way it goes and and the classes that will uh, be involved. But 
um, but Stephen deals with the logistics of rooms and assignments and food and so it's kind of like Johnny's the cruise director. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, Johnny's the cruise director, and and uh, and and Stephen J. Cohen is like Captain Stubing. <laughs> That's right. You have to oh, be I a certain that. age to get that, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, that's true, isn't it? Now, So I'm, I'm fascinated by what Gary said, but we, of course, um, can go on to the APEC question. I'm sure there might be some people here who at least attended the audience. Or not. <laughs> okay so while carol is continuing to get us that information on where we can sign up and how much it is that kind of stuff who else has got a question tonight about audiobooks whether it's audiobook production how to get audiobook work uh performance questions we're lucky enough to have carol with us tonight carol monda who's a uh uh, you know, one of Edge uh, Studios and the uh, Global Voice Acting Academy's leading coaches, especially in the area of audiobooks. So uh, we can accost her for any questions that uh, we might have with regards to performance. I have a question. Can you hear me? Someone is speaking. Yeah, someone's speaking, but again, the levels are really low. Let me put my headphones on, see if I can hear any better. Hi, that was supposed to be me. Evidently, I need to go fix my levels. Um, they are a little on the low side, but we can hear you okay. Um, let's see. Is that any better? Um, no, but that's okay. Go ahead and ask okay. your question, and and All I right. might I might rephrase it if people if somebody needs uh, to uh, if someone doesn't get it and needs to have it uh, you know rephrased. That's cool. Okay, so I just completed a year of training with Edge. Ah, I fantastic! Started up last June, and I just finished up my coaching, and um, I recorded my demo last week. And my question is, my demo was a narration demo, mm -hmm. and I am now saving up again to do coaching for audiobooks next time. Um, Carol Monda, make sure you go to Carol Monda. Yeah, I know, right? Um, but what I'm wondering is how, obviously it's best with coaching, how horrible of a mistake might it be to try and get my toes wet in the interim? Um, to go to ACX year, and try and your levels just got a whole lot better. So thank you for that. I don't know what you did, but I didn't better. do anything. That's odd. Well, welcome to Zoom, which is <laughs> um, so. My opinion, for what it's worth, is that absolutely you should be getting your, um, you know, getting your feet wet in audiobooks, going to ACX and auditioning for some stuff there. Um, but I'm going to bow to Carol Monda and her opinion on this. Um, Carol, do you think it's okay if someone gets started on some of the, you know, lower, lower end books before they actually go out and get their, their first uh, official audio, book? audio book? So do you mean, do you mean that, for example, if you wanted to, uh, at least get your feet wet with ACX and, and do royalty share, would that be a good way in? Well, yeah, something like that. To be able to go on ACX and try and pick up some uh, smaller, probably lower interest, but starter books where they're one hour or two hours of just kind of how you do this or how you do that. They have some of those on there. Sure. To figure yeah. out the process and to... Yeah, see how it works. I think that's the best way. It's, it's, you know, the perfect mix of baptism by fire, but the fire is, you know, at a very low level, you know, and 
I think it's really smart to start with a shorter book. Uh, but certainly ACX, the nice thing is, if you you know dance around the different levels of payment, you might find a book that is in the per finished hour section, for example. Um, there are far fewer of them, but still they exist as yep. opposed to the royalty. And you might just connect really strongly to a particular piece. And there's nothing that says you shouldn't also audition for those. If, right. if you have an up and running studio that you can you know, use uh, long enough each day to, to accommodate the deadlines, which tend to be not too bad with ACX. They, what sort know, of deadlines they, are they? They usually give you about a month at least. Some, okay. uh, I have a person I just directed an audiobook, and she was working for ACX and had three months. So um, it really varies, but in, in the traditional publishing world, you get maybe two weeks at the most to prep, sometimes a week, and then probably a week or so to record it. Okay. I've been concerned about the possibility of an audiobook um, failing on something that I, one of the many things that I don't know that I don't know, <laughs> and then following me forever. Oh, yes. The, you know, that's a, that's a thing I think Rich would agree with this, uh, and anyone else who has, who has uh, experienced the, the aspect of being a beginner and then growing into yourself and yeah. you know, hitting a stride yeah, sure. You've got this piece that will forever be on Audible. Um, but as you said, it's, um, if you can manage to grow the business and grow your experience, um, you will have samples that are, you know, that you're more proud of. Um, okay. And, yeah. and really, I think you should never take, a, a, if you don't feel like you would uh, show your best foot <laughs> um then then maybe you shouldn't take the the job too quickly you know maybe right. get a second opinion about are you ready i yeah. yeah i i totally agree with carol because well first of all disagreeing with carol would be stupid because she's <laughs> far longer than i have but um i would i would just piggyback on that and say there's nothing wrong and carol's right it's a great way to uh well, I think that, you, that, Joy, you put it this way to, um, you know, put your toe in the water. Um, and, and so that's good. But I would also caution against doing any book that is actually crap. So there are a lot of right. books on ACX that are essentially no more than pamphlets. There are others that are far worse than that, which are plagiarized and their summary books that are just the the quote unquote author is just code farming. There are a lot of things that you don't want to associate yourself with. So you need to be careful about dipping that toe in the water and making sure that you don't pick something. I like the way that Jeffrey Kafer puts it, which is audition for books now that you want to be getting good contracts to do with publishing houses five years from now, the types of books that you want to be doing that for. Okay. So, so I would say, don't just do anything. There's nothing wrong with some shorter books, but be careful about what you pick when you're choosing that type of book. <clears throat> because your name can become associated with Absolutely. the quality of the author. Absolutely. That, that is going to follow you for uh, some time to come on, on Audible for at least seven years if you go through ACX and it will be in your portfolio. So uh, I, I think that most of us have one or two books that we think, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But the more you do of them, the worse it is. And so um, right. just, just be cautious about what you accept. The other thing that I would say is that um, you, basically you're asking you know, whether or not to do this or that, and you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. And I think that's great. And one of the things that would concern me is that you said you got a narration demo done, but you want to dip your foot into audiobooks. Okay, that's great. Be very careful about sending a narration demo to anybody who's looking for an audiobook narrator. The, an audiobook demo is very different from a standard narration demo. And especially as you move higher up the food chain, 
nobody who is going to be hiring you at a higher level for doing audiobooks is interested in hearing your narration demo. And right. if you send it to them, they are going to assume that you have no idea what you're doing. Right. And with that, um, when you don't have a narration demo yet and you're trying to do something on ACX or getting started, um, should I, is uploading, you know, recording something and uploading samples just to ACX, obviously not as a demo, um, but is, is that something that would be okay then to put on ACX just as that and then uh, when you get a demo, get that there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's what you want to do is you want to record samples. But again, I would add a caution to that, which is make sure that the samples that you upload are high quality and that they meet ACX specs. And right. if, you don't, if you don't understand ACX specs or if you need help understanding a certain part of ACX specs, absolutely get that ironed out before you jump in. Right. Is there, how would you, how would you go about um, understanding the things that you don't know on the ACX specs? Wow, that's a good question. And the fact that you recognize that there are things that you don't know puts you way ahead of half of the pack. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would just do as much reading as you can. Uh, join the ACX narrator group if you're not already right. there. Your name looks familiar, so I imagine that you're in there. Uh, I don't think so. Indie narrators? Well, look it up. Maybe. Um, you can get a lot of information from the fact there. And then once you read everything in the fact and you follow every thread and every link, then right. you don't ask a question on something you're not familiar with. There's a lot of information from ACX University. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of good information out there. There's also a lot of bad information, but the more you read, I think the more you'll get dialed into what makes good sense. And then if you, st if you have a question about something, you can say, well, I, re I heard this and I heard that. And, you know, which one should I follow? And you'll probably still get a, a mix of answers, but mm -hmm. I think it'll be easier to tell, um, you know, what the right direction is. Okay. Thank you. That's my two cents. I, I hate to do this, but I've got to um, tune out. So um, thank you for letting me be a part. I'm so glad I got to hear Carol oh, again. I, I just, I had one more question oh, for you. Can you hang sure. in another two minutes? Sure. Okay. Um, Dave G's asking, and it sounds like you've had some experience on ACX, so I think you're probably the best to answer this question. After right. 10 or 15 books on ACX, is it now time for Dave to go out and get an agent or audition for publishing houses, or should he continue banging away at ACX for a while? I don't think that's a question that anybody in this kind of a forum can answer. What, what you need to do is, as you're starting to move forward, uh, even as you're beginning, get a coach like Carol, like Johnny, like um, a few others. My, I, I've interviewed, I think, five or six coaches now that are very high level and that I would recommend to anybody on my podcast, the audiobook speakeasy. And I would say, uh, find a coach, work with a coach for a while, and then you'll have a sense of what you, because they'll give you honest feedback and you'll have a sense of what you need to do to be able to move forward. Um, you know, the old saying is you don't get a second chance to make a first impression and you really don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by trying to get out there when you're actually not ready. And the best person to tell you that is somebody who has a whole ton of experience far, far more than I do. And, um, and they'll, um, you know, be able to give you a lot of good information. Rich, before you leave us, make sure you type into the chat box, um, the, uh, info where we can find uh, your uh, voiceover speakeasy podcast, please. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 I'd be happy. Awesome. To. Thank That's you right. so much. It was great to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be a part Thanks, of it. Rich. Come, yep. back, come back anytime. Oh, I will. I have and I will. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I can tell you quickly if you're ready. Um, I just put a few links on, on your uh, chat bar and uh, I'm noticing that Johnny didn't put details up yet so um, this is probably pending I know the dates are definite I'm almost positive it will still be at Whispering Pines Conference Center in Rhode Island um, and if you just even read about the space itself you'll you'll want to go it's um, you know it's two th tw uh, sorry 2300 
uh, acres of secluded pine forest, murmuring brooks and pristine lakes. Um, and, and of course, it's nestled with uh, lots of these little, um, little and large cabins and rooms that um, are, you know, fully equipped, <laughs> heated, uh, air conditioned, Wi-Fi, et cetera. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that. And how much is it, Carol? Is there that detail there? Oh, right. Um, so it isn't, but I have a feeling it's from, from last year um, that it's somewhere in the vicinity of $1,100, um, which includes the lodging, the workshop, and the food. Fantastic. And I assume there's drinking involved. Uh, only I, I cannot comment beyond water, but yes, of course there is. <laughs> Fantastic. Carol, a question from Michelle. What differs a narration demo from an audiobook demo? Because that just came up in, in Rich's comments, and I want to make sure that we understand. What differs a narration demo from an audiobook demo? It's such a great question, and I'm really glad that Rick point, Rich pointed that out. Um, okay, so even though they call audiobook narrators narrators, um, narration itself is generally uh, segregated by everything else that tells and not sells. So aside from animation and promos, and even promos could be considered narration. I mean, my promos, uh, I have a few little, a, a few, what's the word? Um, in my agency, there are departments that are compartmentalized, commercial agents, narration agents, and they're the ones who cast the promos. There are other agencies who have just a promo department. Uh, but the point is that mainly when you think of narration, you think documentary, um, uh, e-learning, uh, how-tos or tutorials, even talking toys uh, could be considered narration. So anything, oftentimes also it's a short form kind of thing, like even telephony, you know, press five for sales. Um, even that is oftentimes on a narration demo. Um, so again, it's, it's uh, not a book. It's not from a book, even though a documentary excerpt may sound very much like a, a nonfiction, let's say, history. Um, but uh, that's the biggest distinction, is that it's, it's telling a story of some kind, or, you know, the biggest, I think, the most popular form of narration nowadays is corporate training. Um, so there's a lot of business in that. But again, that's, that's telling, not, not selling. And it's, uh, and it's certainly not coming from a quote unquote literary source per se. So how long is an, like a narration demo in my experience is a couple minutes long at most where an audiobook demo might be 10 or 12 minutes long. Is that, that, is that correct? That's Yes, that's a great point. Yes, uh, the narration demos are two minutes and the audiobook demos, they change, but the guidelines are basically that you need three pieces in particular genres and that they're each three to five minutes. Some companies prefer that you also have a two minute piece or two um, and you certainly want to reflect narration that is, or audiobook narration, that is nonfiction and fiction with, with dialogue, with men and women in dialogue, um, you know, niche genres like fantasy or young adult or self-help, that sort of thing. Now, Carol, you, you've, you were narrating audiobooks long before ACX ever came around. So you've always done your audiobook narration for the big publishing houses. Yeah. Now, if someone is new to the audiobook business, how do you go about approaching the, the larger publishing houses, the penguins and people like that, in order to you know, ha get some consideration for their roster? Well, I think that the best thing is to get really fine coaching and to make a very competitive demo and then you can direct market that's one of the greatest things about the audiobook world in terms of casting unlike commercials where oftentimes you have to have either you know someone 
that you're whom you're connected with to to you know give you an in or you need an agent um and of course the pay to play sites have some commercial opportunities um certainly non-union opportunities but with audiobooks you you generally it's they're used to just getting submissions um, so you go to these websites, you know, if you um, look at the bigger publishers and you, and you go to their websites and see um, what their requirements are for submission, some will say do not submit, but most are absolutely open to it. And secondarily, I would say it's really smart to join the Audio Publishers Association. Um, because uh, for a couple of reasons they have mixers in la chicago and new york every quarter and you really get to kind of network with some of these publishers um they also you get a subscription to audiophile magazine which is replete with reviews but also interviews with publishers with authors with narrators uh, and you start getting to know names um, and you you can get a feel a better feel for how these people operate and then finally i would say really look into the inventory of these companies you're interested in working for and see oh you know of the books they published last year 70 uh, percent were um you know historical nonfiction, um that sort of thing and so you know sometimes even though we call it a demo nowadays which still is a contiguous file of different samples, they also want you, like on SoundCloud, to, to set up those files separately, and therefore you can take those same individual files and kind of tailor your direct marketing to, let's say, Blackstone, um, you know, based on what you think they, they mostly either want or need, or let's say you go to Audible and you take, you know, you hear some samples of books that you know because of the audiophile magazine uh, were narrated by, you know, person X and you say, oh, I love that author or I love that book. Then you can kind of even tailor what your sample is going to be uh, to, to that company. Just as a point of clarification, Carol, when we were talking about the formatting for audiobook demos, Dave uh, is just asking, when we said 10, 12 minutes, is that for one book or genre or, or several in 10 minutes? And just to be clear, it's like that's going to include three different books in a 10 to 15 minute demo. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I, I'm sorry if I was unclear. It's three to five minutes each sample. Um, and it and it should have those three genres I mentioned: nonfiction, niche, which is again anything other than mainstream, so not romance, not mystery, basically, um, and uh, and the other one is is fiction with a man and a woman in dialogue. So three to five minutes each, uh, and then on top of that, if you can, it would be great to have a two-minute sample of fiction and of nonfiction, and the fiction would be probably better if there's a scene between a man and a woman, or a boy and a mother. Okay, that was pure gold. Aw. Pure gold, Carol, pure gold. Please, I am emanating 18 carrots from my fingertips. <laughs> wow, that's really sweet, good, oh, I'm so glad. But I am, I feel like it's, you know, the Monda show, so let's, Let's move on. Yeah. Do we have some other questions tonight? Some other uh, thoughts? I want to know if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Hi, James. Hi. 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 I, uh, it was one of the, my computer crashed. I had to reboot. Well, you're, we can hear you much better now. Great. Uh, and I, I just like listening to Carol. I like that voice. I just love this. I can listen. I could listen to Carol read the phone book. So, oh, you guys! Uh, I think I have heard her read the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Can you imagine the pay you would get for that? That'd be great. Well, the Manhattan phone book, yeah. <laughs> That's true. So, so James, what were your thoughts on APAC? Uh, actually, I I, I was going to say I went to Joni's thing last year and this year. This was my first APAC, and one of the takeaways, the biggest takeaway I took from both of them, is that. If you want to narrate audiobooks, you have to be an actor. 
you have to be an actor. You can't just read words into a microphone. There's got to be some visceral, some um, uh, empathetic, some something about the human race that you know. I mean, I've been a stage actor for 30 some odd years, but I'm, I'm sort of new at the voiceover thing and I'm new at audiobooks. I never, ever, 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 ever thought I would be doing audiobooks. But you have to have some kind of... Um, some kind of, uh, uh, not empathy, what am I looking for? Some kind of affinity toward acting, whether you've done it in high school, whether you, you're just a show-off class clown, or whether you're a professional. You have to have some kind of something in there to bring to it. So, so James, I know you and that you've, you've got an extensive stage background. Um, and but that you're new to the audiobook business. Right. I know that there's several people on here today who'd be interested. How, how is it that you made that leap into audiobooks? Did you start at ACX? Did you? Yeah, I, I did. And I'm, I'm still, um, I don't want to say floundering around there, but I'm, 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 I'm still there. Um, I had two two big aha moments, uh, two big lightning bolts that struck me. Um, there is a person who offers a course, they call it the ACX masterclass. I'm not going to mention names, but I called in as a, a curiosity because this was something that I thought I might like to do. Uh, I knew nothing about doing it. I liked listening to them, but I didn't know anything about it. And this person that I talked to, I mentioned my background and everything. And he said, well, you're an actor, right? And I said, yeah. He says, you're a storyteller. And I said, yeah. He said, then you're ahead of the game right now because you tell stories. And I went, oh, okay. And the second aha moment I had was um, I listen, used to listen to mo just nonfiction. I wouldn't listen to fiction. I always listened to nonfiction because I liked the information. I liked the, uh, the, um, uh, just the, the facts of the whole thing. And I went to a uh, session at the SAG VO lab at, uh, in New York city with Jamie Matler, who is now at Blackstone. Uh, she's a, an engineer, uh, producer. And I was all snooty and just, you know, I had got my first book on ACX and I said, you know, I, I just want to do nonfiction because um, I, that's all I listen to. And I like to read fiction because I like to create the characters in my head and the story and all that kind of stuff. And she said, why would you deprive a listener of that? And I went, oh, yeah. So I started doing fiction and that's basically all I do now. <laughs> so wow. question for you, James, do you have to yeah. listen to audiobooks to narrate audiobooks? Oh, you, you must, you must, you must listen to audiobooks. If you're going to do them, you have to know, you know, I, I listen to them to study people. Uh, I have my favorites and I've listened to some really, really clunkers, but you, I listen to them to study the people to study the rhythms to study their characters why they make the choices that they make i'll listen to a book and i'll listen to somebody say a sentence and i'll say i wouldn't have said it that way why did they say it that way? so i'm listening to it through uh with my director and my producer's hat rather than my actor's hat an interesting because. question from, from dave um james and again i think this is probably a, a question that you might be you know, a, a good resource for Dave says, I, I just don't like doing fiction. I want, I, I, I like doing, That's fine. is it possible That's to stay in one niche and still be successful? Talk to Sean Allen Pratt about that. He's, he's, he is Mr. Nonfiction. Mm -hmm. That's all he does. And he makes a living doing it. So it, it totally is possible. Absolutely. Yeah. But again, it's not just reading words into a microphone. People think, oh, I just want to do nonfiction because there's no acting there. There is acting there. You are telling the story. You are the author's voice. You have to assume and be the author telling that story. So you have to be an actor, in my opinion. James, you just made Dave's night. He goes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're uh welcome, Dave. 
a question I'm going to throw out to the audience generally, but I'm, I'm really interested in hearing, um, Carol, I'm going to pick on you again, hearing your thoughts on this. Sure. JD says, I've got a controversial question. Is it okay, is it possible to produce your own audiobook demo? Absolutely. The nice thing about an audiobook demo is that it does not have a music bed like a commercial animation, promo, or narration demo. So um, it is just your voice and that's it. Some people choose to uh, have a little piece of music at the beginning. It's sometimes uh, you'll, you'll hear that kind of thing with, let's say, a Harper book. They like to start with a little bit of, you know, uh, mood music or high bridge. We'll mm -hmm. do that once in a while. But again, it's like 15 seconds. But most people are put off by that because it's, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time the audiobook is just you and, and the, uh, the, the deadened space <laughs> of your studio. Um, I would say that it's probably not a good idea to then put your demo up until and if others who are in the business hear it and, you know, um, kind of give it the, the, the thumbs up. Um, yeah. and, and you might want to have a director for the demo as well. But if you're, um, if you're on ACX like I am mostly, and you're producing your own books like I am mostly in my little home studio here because I do the whole nine yards, I direct myself, I, I'm the talent, I'm the producer, I'm the critic, I'm you know the proofer, I'm the master engineer, all that kind of stuff. If you're doing it all on your own, uh, Carol's right to get a second uh, uh, set of ears or a third set of ears or a fourth set of ears to listen to it to make sure that it's good quality. But if you're submitting from your home studio to ACX, there is a certain criteria that you have to meet quality-wise. And you can take snippets from the books you have done, you know, those little male-female dialogue pl places or an action sequence or something like that, right out of a book that you've done and stick it on a demo if the sound quality is good. Yeah, to me. Thank you, James. Thank you, Carol. I just want to say more gold. Aw, good. Wow, you got you guys have great dogs. Um, thanks. And I, James, that was an aw really important point because, um, in fact, I don't know. Maybe you would be the the best person to paste a, a link uh, on this chat, you know, bar. Um, of the ACX specs, uh, because they, generally speaking, will also be required or requested across the board in terms of your DB and such. Yeah, it can be found on the ACX website, um, and I would be able to look up that page, but I'm not there right now. Um, I can try to do that later. Um, but yeah, there, there are certain criteria that you have to meet, like, you know, a uh, uh, negative three DB peak, uh, anywhere between negative 23 and negative 18 DB RMS. Uh, of course you got to eliminate the pops and clicks. There can't be all kinds of background noise. Your noise floor has to be negative 60 DB or lower. Um, you know, just simple things like that. But a lot of people have a lot of trouble with that because first of all, they're not familiar with their software. Uh, second of all, they just don't know what those terms are. So before you dive into ACX and all this other kind of stuff, go through that website and read what the criteria is. You will also find YouTube videos on that kind of stuff. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of videos on all kinds of different uh, digital audio workstations, software, DAWs, we call them, uh, that will show you how to achieve that and with uh, uh, different uh, uh, processing effects plugins to get there. This is not something you just read it into the microphone and it's done and you submit it to ACX and then they kick it back and say, well, your noise floor is too high or uh, this was too loud or you're distorting here. No, if you're going to engineer it, you know, yourself and not send it out, farm it out to somebody else, you have to know these things. Uh, Carol, question for you. Hmm. What is the stance of the bigger publishers on home studios? Do you have to be able to go into a studio 
in New York or Los Angeles or New Jersey, or do some of these big publishers allow you to record from home? Many of the big publishers allow you to record from home and even encourage it because it means their overhead is, is less. They don't have to rent a studio, an engineer, you know, keep the lights on, or they can have, you know, only celebrities like recorded books, for example. Um, even though they, they don't want home studio narrators for the most part, they at least will send you to another studio outside of theirs with an engineer. But there are many like Dion Publishing, uh, um, Tantor, Blackstone, Brilliance, several, uh, Audible, uh, who, who absolutely encourage home studio submissions. And in fact, they want, when you do the submission, it's, it's kind of a strange, you know, catch 22. They want a professional demo. Um, and, you know, they, they tend to feel like it's more professional if you have it done at a professional studio rather than a home studio. But they will always ask you, regardless, to send a sample, a two minute sample from your home studio, just so they can see if it does, in fact, meet their specs. Now, I have a question on that in that uh, do those publishing houses have their own engineers who um, they do the proofing, they do the, uh, the mastering themselves. They don't trust you to do that at your home studio, right? Well, Dion is very much like ACX in the sense that they do want you to either hire an engineer outside engineer or, or you know, know your stuff. Um, so that you can kind of master the entire thing. But the rest tend to just want raw files that you've punch and rolled, punched and rolled, um, and, and they will do the rest. You're right. Uh, J, uh, JD uh, posts that um, there is a plugin that's available that verifies if you've achieved the proper specs for ACX. Oh. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's Stephen J. Cohen's second opinion. If you go on Stephen J. Cohen's uh, <laughs> website, it's called Second Opinion. The only thing with that is it doesn't work on an MP3. It works on WAV files and AIFF files only. But it will not correct. He used to, it, it, in the first version of it, it actually corrected the file. But he, uh, he doesn't do that anymore. The, the new version of it isn't a correction. It's just telling you whether you're in spec or not. That's Carol, yeah. when you're prepping for an audiobook read, do you read the entire book or do you skim it or do you read cold? Oh, I love this question. I think it's a great question. I do too. It's, it's certainly just my opinion. But I would say absolutely read the book. You mm -hmm. don't want surprises in chapter 40 that suddenly Uncle Charlie has a lovely Irish brogue. That's number one. But really, in terms, going back to uh, James's idea of acting, you, you really do want to get a sense of the arc of a piece. Where is this going? And, and maybe the person who seems like, you know, the salt of the earth, the... Uh, savior of you know the neighborhood is in fact the criminal by the end um, you you don't want to foretell that but you having that information will in some way inform how you want to set it up um, yeah, so that's is... that's that's the main thing but I will say that there are many narrators who do not read the whole book and some who actually intentionally read it cold because they want to feel like the audience does as though they're in the midst of discovering this story as it unfolds uh, itself. Really? I hadn't heard that point of view before. That's interesting. Really? Yeah. Ralph Cosham, who has now uh, since passed, but he was a fantastic uh, narrator and actor. Um, he actually in interviews would say, oh no, I, I, I'm, sometimes I'm even tempted to read it, but I don't because I want to not only feel the element of surprise, but offer it to the audience so that we're more in simpatico with, with this story than I'm some kind of you know, leader or, or force um, driving it. If I was to ask- correct in, in saying that Simon Vance is also that way, he can read it cold. Not that he prefers to do it that way, but he can read a book cold. 
Yes. And, and many of us, you know, in some, in some circumstances, there will be, you know, a call for a book. Like I had a call for a book and, and Macmillan said, you know, it's dense. And I thought that's okay. And she said, you know, uh, you'll get it tomorrow and you'll start on Monday. And tomorrow was Thursday. And it wound up being a 700 page book with, I am not kidding you, about 30 French words on every other page at least. Uh. So I read it as quickly as I could, but the research, uh, which we all have to do, by the way, you know, uh, looking up pronunciations, uh, understanding maybe even the dramaturgy of it. In other words, like um, doing some research on the background of this story, if it is nonfiction, or if you've never done an 80-year-old woman uh, and you're a guy or, or you're a woman, um, y- you might want to YouTube, you know, uh, older people speaking, um, that sort of thing. So it, it does, you know, really take time, even if you're not reading the whole thing. Um, but Simon is, he's so good and so experienced that, um, you know, I think he's one of those people in the school of once you've done almost every genre, you feel like you know the formula. And in fact, of course, there's some formula, even Harlequin, for example, you know, it has this very rigid thing of, it must be 206 pages to to the author. Um, You must have, you know, a fight uh, within these pages, you must have them make up, and then they have to get married, or at least engaged by the end. You know, so so many people do just rely on the fact that there's a formula, and so, you know, they feel as though, well, I've done this kind of thing before, so how different could it be? But again, I'm just saying, it is really hard when people, some of my students have, have done this and then they had to record hours of it because again, a character, you know, had a lisp. Yeah. And the other thing too is um, you, you have to, to like Carol said, know the arc of the story, but there are also arcs within the arc, like a, 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 a chapters will wrap themselves up in a certain way. This is something that I sort of learned from uh, Barbara Rosenblatt, is that there are arcs within arcs. There are even arcs in sentences or arcs in phrases that you need to to figure out. But um, one of the stupidest things that I just did was uh, I got a, P, a, a word file from an author, and he promised to send me the finished manuscript in a PDF, and I thought, well, you know, I'll just skip that process and I'll make my own PDF because I, you know, my eyes are bad and I like big text and I need to read. Well, I read from my PDF. And then when I got his PDF, it was a revision of what happened. And I already started recording. And today I spent hours correcting myself, re-editing and re uh, a re-recording because I made that mistake. Don't ever make that mistake. <laughs> but, but James, and just quickly, did they? It, was there an implication though that you were you were reading from a master? Yeah, um, yeah. I well, I thought not, the, I thought the word file was the final uh, final manuscript, and it wasn't. Yeah, this happens sometimes, and that is not your mistake. In fact, I would charge them for the extra work. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm. The, I'm <laughs> Unless they did say, this is just a draft, you know, yeah. don't start recording. It. But, but really, that does happen, and it's, you know, it, it, it cannot be. Uh, this is the lowest paying of the voiceover genres. It's, it takes the longest, the most sweat and blood and tears and heart. Uh, it takes so much prep. You, you deserve to make more than 25 cents an hour if, you ha- if, if there is a mistake on their part. Okay, Carol, I have to ask, you had that incredibly dense book with 30 French words on every page, and you had a weekend to get ready. Did you have all of the pronunciations for that? Did they bring any sort of resources for you to be able to record that correctly? Or is French just something that you do? How does that Oh, no, no, mon dieu. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they asked that I look things up as much as I could, and so I did. But after I realized in the first five pages that 
oh my God, there are 120 already. Um, I did I did reach out and say, do you have any uh, resource like a research department like like for example Blackstone does and Recorded Books does, um, and and she indeed did get me some um, some some pronunciations and. Uh, Sometimes they weren't correct. So, mm. you know, that was also uh, kind of a, an issue that, that came up in the proofing. Uh, but, but they realized that they hadn't maybe done the, the correct research. Um, but for the most part, they really did help a lot. I would assume if they give you that little time that they would have to bear the burden of the preparation because, I mean, it, it, they didn't give you time to do anything else. Well, and I, I'll say this one more thing about that. Um, a lot of the producers uh, don't know the specifics of the books that they're casting. Hmm. They will sometimes read the specs, the uh, uh, treatment, um, even the, uh, you know, the, the jacket, <laughs> um, and or they'll read the first 10 pages. Um, but sometimes they don't know. They only think it's dense because of the length of it or because this woman, in this case, this biography, she had so many things happen to her and around her. Um, so, so that was what they kind of glommed onto. Um, and in some ways, there are producers who, they may have read something, but they don't, they're not in the head of, of, of the narrator, so they don't really think, oh, this is going to take a lot of time for her to, you know, look up Icelandic, where, you know, an F is, you know, that's the sound. <laughs> um, so, so that, that's another issue that, that sometimes does come up. So you can feel free to ask for, for some help. And some people I know even hire people who are French or who would be willing to, to do mm. all of the research. Ladies and gentlemen, what a great conversation we've had tonight. Uh, Carol Monda, specifically want to say thanks to you for, again, as always, being so generous and sharing your expertise and your experience. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I'm sorry. If, if, if anybody feels like, oh, my God, she, she upstaged the entire thing, um, you know, you can just. Oh, just this is. Oh, my goodness. She was this. wonderful. This is a free one-hour coaching session from Carol Monda. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So much. And, and for those of you who are looking for Carol Monda and are interested in audiobook coaching, you can find her through the GVAA website. That's the Global Voice Acting Academy. Or you can reach her through Edge Studio or at Carol Coaches. Is that what it is, Carol? Co Co coaching at Carol Monda VO, which I just... Uh, okay. Coaching yeah. at Carol Monda VO. So that's the third way that you can get a hold of her and you get her directly that way. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for your time, your attention tonight, your investment of, of an hour. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, an hour that uh, you can put towards uh, the giant scorebook on the investment that you're making in your career. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Have a great- Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Have a great week. Book lots of work. And we'll talk to you again next Sunday night. Bye, everybody. Bye.